All right, well, we welcome everyone tonight and those who will be watching this via YouTube. Last week, we did a teaching on what I call the astrological and anatomical reality of Golgotha. And we found out that crucifixion took place in the heavens. The heavens declare the handiwork of God. Crucifixion took place in Jesus, and he went to the cross as us, as to who we thought we were. But we found out as well that crucifixion takes place as our energy fields begin to be open, our nerve centers begin to be open, and as the energy begins to flow out of the solar plexus, activating the pineal and the pituitary, that was known to the ancients as crucifixion as well. And the reason they called it crucifixion was because it consumed, in a sense, it consumed the pineal, changed the consistency of the pineal from a granular substance into more of a stone or a hardness. And we know that when our pineal and when the pituitary together are activated, we then begin to experience in our bodies, because our bodies are called land, we begin to experience the land flowing with milk and honey. Now we looked at several words. We looked at Mount Calvary because Jesus was crucified outside of the gates of Jerusalem. He was crucified in Golgotha, Golgotha on Mount Calvary. And we found out that Golgotha means the skull, Mount Calvary means the skull. We also found out that Jesus was the testator according to the book of Hebrews. And the first five letters of testator also means the skull. What took place in Jesus' death was that the veil was rent. Now, the veil is where? Well, it's in our skull. It's in our head. The veil was rent simply meaning that as we turn within to spirit, as 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about, the veil that was done away at the death is then taken away from between our ears, and we experience in the death that which has been exposed that we embraced religiously, and in his resurrection, the truth is revealed as to who we have always been from before the foundation of the world. One of the meanings also of resurrection is the discovery of spiritual truth. So that is what is happening. His death exposed the lies. Remember when he was on the cross and he looked at those that nailed him to the cross and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That was the time he began to expose the lies that those people and we as well had embraced. And then in his resurrection, as we stated, truth then began to be revealed unto us. Now, what we need to see <clears throat> is that the truth that is revealed to us is truth that has always been the truth. Scripture talks about eternal truth. All truth that is truly the truth is eternal truth, meaning it's always been the truth. So I could say it this way. The truth that is being revealed to us, we're discovering. That's good. Anyone who invented anything, any inventor, they didn't come up with the invention themselves. They discovered something that was always the truth. They discovered the different laws of nature and the different laws of whatever invention that they were involved in. So we found that out last week. And then tonight, I want us to go to a scripture. We're going to talk about the allegorical reality of crucifixion. We're going to look at Matthew 27, just a little bit more, and I'll repeat a few things, but I want us to see it in a little different way. But I want to read, first of all, from Revelation 11 and verse 8. I'm just going to briefly talk about this, and then next week I'm going to really unpack it. But a lot of times people wonder why the scripture says things that almost seem to be contradictory. Well, here's one of those verses in Revelation 11 and verse 8. And it's talking about the two witnesses, and we're going to talk about the two witnesses next week. But it's talking about the two witnesses, and it says there, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually, now listen to that word, which spiritually, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, the key is the word spiritually, because we know that Jesus was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. But it says here, 
he was spiritually crucified in Sodom and Egypt as well. So what could this be talking about? Well, the key word is spiritual or spiritually. And we're going to unpack that next week. But let me just give you a little, a little taste to kind of wet in your taste buds concerning this a little bit. Sodom and Egypt refers to the left side. Jerusalem, which means peace, refers to the right side, the Christ mind or spirit. So those that put him on the cross, those that put him on the cross were coming from spiritually Sodom and Egypt. They were coming from the left side. And remember he said that those that crucified him, had they known, they never would have crucified the Lord of glory. And he forgave those that crucified him. And he said, they don't even know what they're doing. And so we're going to unpack that next week. We're going to see some interesting things about Sodom and Egypt and Jesus spiritually being crucified there because he couldn't be crucified naturally in two places. Either he was crucified in Jerusalem or outside the gates of Jerusalem or in Sodom and Egypt. Well, obviously, we know he was not crucified in Sodom literally or Egypt literally, so it has a spiritual meaning, and we'll look at that. It'll be very interesting. Then we're going to look at the two witnesses next week. Now, remember when I incorporated the book of Revelation into mind-brain connections, I said we are going to apply it to our physical body because I said the temple represents our body, and much is written in Revelation surrounding the temple. And I also said much is written in Revelation surrounding the throne, and a throne is where we rule from, but we can only rule from the throne of our Christ mind. So when we look at the two witnesses next week, I'd love to do it now, but next week when we look at it, we're going to see the two witnesses from the aspect of our body, from our physical body. We're going to see some really cool things, I think. But let's go to Mark before we get into this tonight. In Mark chapter 4 and verse 11, look what it says here. Mark chapter 4 and verse 11 says, and he, speaking of Jesus, said unto them, unto you it is given to know, not just know about, but to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but unto them that are without. In other words, those that are trying to interpret it literally, they're never going to tap into what the parables point to. And then it goes on, all these things are done in parables. In other words, there has to be a symbolic meaning for us to everything that we see in the scriptures. It had its literal interpretation, yes, to Israel. But for us, we must see the parabolic, the allegoric, the proverbial, the spiritual, and the symbolic. Otherwise, we're left, you know, with the fact that there was some controlling, if we take it literally, we're left with the fact that there was a controlling element one day, that could not forgive people unless someone was killed. And of course we know that as penal substitutionary atonement. And so what this points to is the fact that scriptures address us and scriptures show us that in order for us to subjectively experience what is already true of us objectively, we have to tap within to the realm of spirit. We have to come in to the understanding of the parabolic and the symbolic and the spiritual meanings of the scripture rather than trying to interpret them literally. That's what has gotten people in trouble and that's why they have you know, taught that God couldn't forgive unless he killed his son. Because they were trying to look at this in a literal sense rather than a spiritual and an allegorical sense. Now, as I said, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 27. And I want to begin reading at verse 26 of Matthew 27. And look at this in a spiritual, symbolic, allegorical sense. And we'll begin to see what really is being stated here beyond just the literalism. Now, certainly Jesus literally went to the cross and certainly we were crucified, you know, uh, with him, the scripture says, and, and as him. But what was crucified? The thing that was crucified where we are concerned was who we thought we were. Not who we were, who we thought we were. And so as Colossians 1.21 says, we were alienated or we had a sense of separation and we were enemies, but where? In our mind. Only in our mind. And there are many scriptures that allude to that and would show us that. But look at Matthew 27 verse 26. Then released he Barabbas unto them 
And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So in other words, the controlling factor of the day here releases Barabbas. But where did he release or did they release Barabbas? Unto the multitudes. Why? Because the multitudes had no idea and no revelation concerning the value of life. And so, just as when Jesus walked on the water, remember, he told his disciples to get in the ship and go to the other side. But it says he released the multitudes. Why? Because multitudes always follow the crowd rather than the cloud. Multitudes, they were the ones that were persuaded by the chief priests and elders to crucify Jesus. The multitudes live out of and think out of the left side. So here we have Jesus and Barabbas. Jesus is crucified. Barabbas is, you know, released to the people or to the multitudes. Jesus denotes the right side. Barabbas denotes the left side. And remember the people, you know, the multitudes or the crowds, they said, uh, you know, who should, who should we release? Or, or who should be released here? Who should be crucified, they're asking. Who should be crucified? Who should be released? And they said, give us Barabbas. And Barabbas was released, and Jesus was the one then that was crucified. Now, all of that, to me, all of that, to me, designates that the crowd will always choose for that which is opposed to the value of life. That shows me that the crowds or the multitudes will choose to follow the lower consciousness rather than the higher consciousness. People in general, as I've already stated, will follow the crowd, the masses, rather than following the Christ life. Multitudes will always follow the crowd. The few that know how to tap within and live from the inside out they're the ones that will follow the Christ life. So Barabbas then represents the culture. Barabbas represents the traditions and the doctrines of men. Barabbas represents that which is literalism as opposed to that which is spiritual. In fact, religion always says to stay away from turning within, stay away from meditation. They discourage it rather than encourage it. And I believe one of the reasons is because they want people to be under their thumb. They want to control the crowds. And so they don't want people to turn within and come to know Christ for themselves and come to realize and understand who they have always been and come to know who they are objectively so that they then can, as they turn within, come to experience the subjective experience in their life of Christ. Now, we talked about the scourging last week, and I shared with you how in the scourging of Jesus, they brought him and they tied him to a pole, and they got these cattle nine tails, and they beat him on the back. Now, why the back? And I understand that, you know, they were very sharp points at the end of the cat of nine tails, and I also understand it came around the side and came to the front, and it, his flesh was just totally opened up, but it began on the back. Why did it begin on the back? It began on the back simply because they were disdaining and they were against the health that would flow from people who have the energy fields and the nerve centers open and the health that would come from people that have the energy flowing. They didn't want that. The crowds didn't want that. The religious people didn't want that. And so they were the ones that began with the scourging of Jesus with his backside. Now, I came to understand something just in the last week and a half that, you know, I should have known, and I probably did in one way, but I saw it in black and white when I researched it. And that is when the energy is flowing within our physical bodies, when the solar plexus release that energy, what it is doing is distributing the life that God gave us to every part of our body. That's what it does. It distributes the life. And my great niece, you know, that, that died after this car accident, when the doctor said, you know, uh, she'll not live, so you might as well unhook her from the life support. Why? Because they realized that her life was not going to be properly distributed throughout her body, and she'd be a vegetable for the rest of her, however many days she would live. 
And they tell us, and you can Google this, that once a person has had the solar plexus damaged, if it's bad enough, they only live about 9, 10 days. That's the longest that they can live because the energy, see, because God gave us, you know, there's, there's two types of life and energy. We have Zoe life flowing within us, but we also have bios, biological life flowing. Well, the biological life came from God just as well as the Zoe life came from God. And so we need the bios life flowing just as well as we need the Zoe life flowing within our physical bodies. Now, in Revelation chapter 1, I'm not going to have to have you turn there, but in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 1, when we did the teaching and incorporated the book of Revelation into our mind-brain series, and I applied it to the physical body, we found out there in Revelation 5, 1, that we are the book of spirit. But the problem is we have been sealed on the back side with seven seals. And so this is why, listen, this is why they scourged Jesus starting on the back because they did not want the book of life to flow. They did not want the book of life to be unsealed on the back side. And so that's why they decided to rip him in pieces because the system despises anything that causes you and I to turn within. The system despises anything that would cause people to no longer have to trust in man to lay hands on them and get them healed. And I'm not against that. You know, if people need hands laid on them for healing, I'm, you know, I'm all for that. But there's a greater way and there's a better way. And that is, as Luke said, physician, heal thyself when we can learn to draw from our own well and realize that we have the same thing within us that Jesus Christ had within him in his life and in his ministry. Now, what I want to continue on with this message tonight is I want us to see something based upon a couple of scriptures that have really jumped out at me recently. One is when Jesus said, don't ask me to do anything because I can't do nothing. I myself can do nothing. And the other one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16 where it says we are to know Christ no longer after the flesh. And let me say this in relationship to that. The phrase, the three words son of man points to our feminine part. The son of man points to our feminine part. Jesus when he came here as a man, he emptied himself out of all deity attributes or powers. Otherwise, they couldn't have killed him because God in and of himself, in an abstract way, could not die. He could not have been tempted as he was in Luke chapter 4 because God cannot be tempted, neither tempts he any man. So when Jesus came here, he emptied himself of any deity that he would have within himself. And he called himself son of man, except for maybe one, two at the most times, he called himself son of God. But he always called himself son of man. Now, son of man, that flesh part of Jesus points to our feminine principle, points to our physical aspect, points to our flesh realm. And the five senses, Jesus upon the cross of Calvary, he had seven wounds total. But on the cross of Calvary, he had five wounds, two on both hands, two on both feet, and one on the side. That's five. And he bore those. He took those wounds on the cross, which represent, which represent the fact that our five physical senses, senses objectively have been made powerless. But subjectively, for us to live above the five senses or to have the five senses spiritualized to where we see and we taste that he's good and we feel after him, to have the five senses one with spirit, with the right, we have to understand, yes, Jesus objectively overcame those as us at the cross so that subjectively we can walk above the five physical senses in and of themselves. So, so Jesus, in other words, the fleshly part of us is the part that has the capacity to go from son of man to son of God subjectively. And Jesus, son of man, and again, 2 Corinthians 5, 16 tells us we're to know him no more after the flesh. We're not to know him after the man of Galilee. 
And beyond that, Jesus himself was the one that said, don't ask me for anything, I can do nothing. I only do what I see the Father do, I only say what I hear the Father say. So there's an aspect of us that must be yielded exactly as the aspect, the Son of Man aspect of Jesus had to be yielded. Now, look at verse 27, Matthew 27, 27, as we take this further. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers. Now, why are soldiers brought out here? Because a soldier is one, for example, if someone signs up or enlists for the armed services, they're going to go through what they call boot camp strenuous exercise, they're going to be brought to the place to where every part of them is going to submit and yield and do what they're told to do. And a soldier here designates a disciple. Disciples are what? Disciplined ones. I, I saw someone today on Facebook, either yesterday or today, they wrote and they said, well, we're not soldiers, we're believers. Well, you can say all you want, but as a believer, you're going to learn to be a soldier if you're going to subjectively experience and you're going to learn to be a disciplined one yeah. if you're going to subjectively experience what I'm talking about here. Luke chapter 9 verse 24 says, He who seeks to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake shall find it. That's talking about finding the Son of God part subjectively. It's talking about losing the Son of Man part. And so once we understand this, you see, then we can have that feminine part of us not done away with because there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing was wrong with Jesus. Nothing is wrong with our virgin consciousness. Nothing is wrong with our left side. It's when it is challenged or tempted by emotions and appearance realm and five senses. It's when we operate out of intellect in and of itself or reasoning in and of itself or logic in and of itself that something becomes wrong with it. Because it was made as what? Son of man to submit and to yield. Some people would say crucify. Well, uh, you know, I, I could use crucify. It has to be crucified, if you will. I'm not talking about crucifying you because you're Christ. Why would you want to crucify Christ? So we're not crucifying our lives or ourselves in that sense. But it is a sort of a crucifixion. It is a laying down, if you will. Now, remember, Jesus looked at his disciples one day, and this is what he said. He said, it is better for you, it is more expedient for you that I leave, that I go away. And, and listen, yet many people are waiting for the man Jesus Christ with the scars on his hands, the scars on his feet to come back on a white stallion. And I don't know why, it would be a lot better if they would just say, you know, if he would just be translated here. Why does he have to have a horse if you believe that he's going to physically come back? He was translated before as Philip and Enoch and Elijah. But anyhow, back to my point. Uh, he said, it's better for you that I go away. Otherwise, you're going to just trust in me all the time to do all this stuff rather than realize the same Christ, the same Son of God, the same Father is in you that is in me. And so people are declaring, you know, that he's going to come back. Listen, rather than realizing that it's the Christ as us that's coming back, not the man Jesus in that son of man aspect, but it's the Christ. He comes in clouds, and clouds are always people. So that's the coming of Christ in all his glory is in a people. But yet people want him to literally come back when he said, it's better for you that I go away because I can't do anything in anyhow. <laughs> now, that's making it good, kind of being pretty strong with that, but that's really the way it is. So unless we yield... Unless we yield that Son of Man part, just as Jesus did, we will not subjectively experience, you see, the Father or the consciousness of Christ. And that has to happen in order for us to experience who we have always been objectively. So when the Jesus part, let me say it this way, when the Son of Man part or the Jesus part is relinquished, then we experience the Christ part. Then we experience the right side. Not throwing away the feminine principle, but yielding it, yielding it unto the right side. Just yielding it unto the right side. So, 
you know, Jesus told us himself that we are to know him no more after the flesh. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16. And Jesus said it as well when he said, it's better for you that I go away. You should no longer be in a position where you're wanting to know me. This is what he was saying to his disciples. Where you're wanting to know me as son of man or as, and I know this is going to be strong, or as the word made flesh. He was the word made flesh. We're the word made flesh. But what is the flesh part? What is the body part? What is our earth part? Well, it's the left side. Nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with it, unless it's operating in and of itself and hasn't yielded or been swallowed up by the truth of the right side, by the Christ mind, or by the Spirit. Now, look at verse 28. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. Now, this is so important because to be naked is to remove all of the coverings or things that we would, in a religious or worldly way, cling to. That's what naked is. Remember, Adam and the woman were naked in Genesis, but not ashamed. They had no encumbrances, worldly or religiously. They were naked, and they were not ashamed. It was only when they partook of the truth of the knowledge of good and evil that their awareness fell, and all of a sudden, oh, we need to get some coverings here. And I kind of joked around about this Sunday evening. I said, we have two nudists in the garden eating apple pie, and the snake talks to them and says, hey, what's that, Adam? And so Adam runs for some fig leaves, and he gets one, and the woman gets three. And that's really, I'm embellishing that, but sometimes you have to kind of say it in a humorous way in order for people to get the stupidity of some of the stuff that we have believed, and we've started people on the wrong foot. So listen, in verse 28, in verse 28, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. So when the Jesus part was stripped, or we'll say yielded, and is yielded away from us, what are we doing? We are taking these things away from ourselves. We're taking the veil away. We're taking the worldly encumbrances. We're taking the religious traditions and doctrines of men away from us. And listen, he's not going to do that. He did away with the veil, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But we must take it away by turning within into spirit, and the Lord is that spirit. And as we turn within, we then take away that which he did away objectively. We take it away subjectively. So they stripped him, notice here, and they put on him a scarlet robe. So the color scarlet to the ancients from G.A. Gaskell's book that gives a lot of meanings about what the ancients believed, certain words meant back then, Scarlet to the ancients meant divine life. So the Jesus part, the thoughts of the outside, see, and, and you put this on yourself, you do this yourself, he's not doing it for us. Jesus did not put on his own thoughts, but he only put on the thoughts of the Father. He only put on the thoughts of kingship. In fact, scarlet is what kings wore. That's the color that kings wore. Scarlet. And so what did he do? He removed, in any temptation that he had, what did he do? He removed any temptation where it says he was stripped. That points to the fact that in his temptation, he removed any tendency to yield to any temptation of turning the stones into bread and all those temptations that he went through. And by doing that, what did he do? He put on the thoughts of the Father. In other words, he put on the scarlet robe. He put on that which designated kingship, and he ruled from what? From the mind of his Father, rather than allowing the temptation to overtake him. And so that's what we see in verse 28, where it talks about they stripped him and they put on him a scarlet robe. Now, hang on to Matthew 27, and look quickly to Proverbs 31, and verse 21, Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 21. And this is mystical as well, speaking about the scarlet clothing. In Proverbs 31 and verse 21, and this is talking about the virtuous woman. In fact, the word virtuous is really the word rare. She was a rare woman. And it's speaking about our feminine principle. 
Our feminine principle, our virgin consciousness, is rare as long as it is continually being yielded to the Christ mind. See, And it says of this virtuous woman in Proverbs 31 that she was greater and better than all the other daughters. Why? Because she applied herself. She was a very industrious woman, spiritually speaking, and she applied herself and became greater than all of the other daughters, the scripture says. But notice what it says about the scarlet clothing in uh, verse 21 of Proverbs 31. It says, she is not afraid of the snow for her household. For all her household are clothed with scarlet. So she, which is what? She would be our son of man principle, our Jesus part, our left side, our intellect, reasoning, logic, our earth or our bodies, our awareness, our individual awareness. So she, that which is our individual awareness, joined with spirit or joined with our Christ mind is not afraid of the snow. Now what's the snow? Snow is water which is truth. Water is designating truth most of the time in the scriptures. So snow is water which is truth but it's bound by that which is cold and unrelenting of the outside or external or the literal. So snow is the word that is bound by the unrelenting cold or the literalism. And this woman is not afraid of the snow. Then it goes on, for all her household are clothed with scarlet, the mind of the king. Ruling and reigning with the mind of the king. And so none of them are afraid of the literalism. Because they have the mind of the king, they've turned within and they see the scriptures according to the parabolic, the allegoric, the spiritual, the symbolic, the proverbial. They see it that way. So they're not afraid of the literalism when someone comes along and they're speaking, you know, literally Jesus is going to come back on a white stallion or, or literally, you know, this scripture is a literal interpretation and people are going to be burnt in hell, scorched and torched eternally in penal substitution and original sin that people interpret literally. She's not afraid of that. Why? Because her household is clothed with the mind of the king. Now, back to Matthew 27. And verse 28, he's stripped and he's no longer touched by the outside. That's what that designates in Matthew 27, 28. He's stripped and he's no longer touched by the outside, but he's covered with the divine or with the scarlet. And that's the Jesus part of us, stripped from us, and the Christ aspect being experienced in us as us subjectively. We're walking in it now. We're walking in it. Now, verse 29 of Matthew 27. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head, and a reed in his, notice what hand, right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, at this time, what were they doing? They were mocking Jesus. The crown of thorns is what? It's their disdain for the higher consciousness. And they are mocking him by putting upon the cross above him, Hail, the King of the Jews. Jesus never wanted that. And notice this reed was in his right hand, which is a scepter of power, wisdom, and righteousness. And where is it? In his right hand. And the crown of thorns to the ancients represented the higher consciousness. And the crown also represents the pineal gland. It's the crown energy field. See, so their disdain for all of this that we've been talking about is putting the crown of thorns, taking that reed that was in his right hand, hitting him on the head with it, mocking him by saying or writing above him on the cross, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, what does that represent, Hail, King of the Jews? Notice at the end there, verse 29, they wrote, Hail, King of the Jews. Now, what Jesus previously said about that when he was in conversation with him about that is, my kingdom is not of this world. And so what do his followers, so-called followers, seek to this day? Well, him coming back, setting up a kingdom, just like the Jewish people when he came the first time. You know, they thought he was going to set up a kingdom. 
But he said, my kingdom is not of this world. So what is the meaning here then of them riding, hail king of the Jews? Well, as I said, they were mocking him. And if we would read in Romans chapter 2, I'm not going to turn there, but in verses 28 and 29, Paul there says by the Spirit, he is not a Jew that is one that is born in the Middle East, or he is not a Jew that is one outwardly, but he is a Jew that is one that is a Jew inwardly. And what that was saying is, spiritually speaking, it's not talking about Jewish people in the Middle East, and I'm not, you know, trying to put anyone down over in the Middle East. We, we're thankful that the word came through that avenue and that venue and so forth. But I do not believe that God has any people that are above any other people. All men were in Christ Jesus from before the foundation. So what is he simply saying here? He's saying, I am, this is what should be written because this is what Jesus said when they questioned him about it. Not hail king of the Jews, but Jesus himself said, I think it was in John chapter 18, he said, I am king of the Jews. He adds, I am to that. So what is that spiritually saying to us? It's saying to us that I am the king of the Jews. What he was trying to get across there was that the right side being the tribe of Judah, the right side being spirit, the right side being the Christ mind, he was saying, those are the people, the people that know their I amness, those are the people that I am king of the Jews over and in and as. See, and once we begin to understand this, my kingdom is not of this world, then we realize Jesus is not coming back in a literal sense, the same man that was hung on a cross to make everything right, to set up a kingdom, to reign for a thousand years, and to make everything right. He gave that to the sons of the right hand. He gave that, he gave that to the true Jewish people, which is what? Which is who? Which is simply a people, not that are Jews outwardly, but a people that are Jews inwardly, that have had circumcision of heart, whose praise is not of men, but of God alone. So that's what he was saying there when they were mocking him by putting on the sign King of the Jews and later in conversation he talked about the fact I am King of the Jews. He was associating being King of the Jews being King of Kings in a people that allow him to be King by yielding what? The Jesus part, the Son of Man part unto the Son of God part. A people who say the same thing as Jesus. I of myself can do nothing. What I see Father do I do. What I hear him say, that I say. Now, we talked also about the two thieves just a little bit. One on either side of Jesus. And I shared with you how that since Golgotha is the skull. We talked about this last week, I think. Since Golgotha is the skull, Mount Calvary is the skull. Testator, the first part of that is the skull. In our skull is our individual awareness. Okay? So the two thieves, if, if Golgotha and Mount Calvary is the skull, then the two thieves had to be the two eyes on, on our skull, on the outside of our skull. And Jesus in the middle representing what? The, the center or the single eye. And remember the one thief on the left or malefactor on the left, he was complaining about, well, you know, if you, you're so strong, and save us and yourself. Right. And then the one on the right said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he began to, in a sense, criticize the other thief for saying what he said. Now, we're going to look at this a little bit more next week as we dig into the two thieves a little bit more. But look at verse 30 of Matthew 27. Verse 30. Because they're not finished yet. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. Now spit is a sign of contempt. And what is this spit? If it's a sign of contempt, what are they in contempt of? They are in contempt of the Christ within. That's what they're coming against and in contempt of. And then it says they took the reed and they smote him on the head. Now reed is a, is a symbol of authority and head is a symbol of authority. So they take the reed, the symbol of authority and righteousness and wisdom, and they beat him on that which is 
is the authority, which is the head, which in Jesus was what? The mind of God. Since he didn't do anything or say anything but what he saw the Father do and say. So the hitting on the head simply denotes that they are opposing any authority. And you see, they took their authority and they put burdens on people where Jesus took his authority of God, the Christ consciousness, and he blessed people everywhere he went. See, and we've gone all through the religious system and we have seen that it has been nothing but bondage and lies and, and things that have been ministered to us that has not been the truth. And all that Jesus used his authority of the Father for was to simply heal people, open blinded eyes and deaf ears and raise people from the dead. He used it. He used his authority from the Father in a blessing way rather than as religion has used their authority to beat people and put burdens on people. So they spit on him, they took the reed, they smote him on the head. Verse 31, And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. So eventually they led him away to crucify him, which denotes allegorically that it's the lower flesh that must be swallowed up by the higher. It's us presenting our bodies a living sacrifice. They led him away to crucify him. They crucified Jesus Christ. And again, allegorically, yes, his death, his crucifixion was our crucifixion as to who we thought we were, objectively. But as far as allegorically, him being crucified represents us presenting our bodies a living sacrifice and doing exactly as he did, taking the Jesus part and yielding it to the Christ part. Taking the Son of Man part and allowing it to transmute into Son of God, which is living from within, living from within. Now, in closing, I'm, I'm done here. To simplify the part about Jesus, everything being stripped away from him, everything that touched him from the outside, and the putting on of the divine part or the scarlet robe, let me ask you a few questions as we close. What did Jesus do in his life and in his ministry when he healed people, when he raised the dead, when he opened blinded eyes? deaf ears, even when he cast out demons, which I don't believe was a literal casting out of some entity. What did he do? Every single solitary time he took that son of man part and he yielded it to the son of God part within him, the father or the Christ consciousness, and did only what he saw the father do, said only what he heard the father say. What did he do when they took him to the whipping post? What did he do when they pulled out his beard? What did he do when they tied him to the whipping post and they beat him to where one translation said his body looked like hamburger meat? What did he do? He yielded. He didn't fight back. He didn't retaliate. He looked at those when he was on the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. What did he do? In his death, he exposed all of the lies that religion brought down the pike. And in his resurrection, he revealed all of the truth that had always been the truth about us. So when we are exposed and the truth is revealed, we see that we as Christ, as we have transmuted our left side to the right side or the son of man side or the, even the word made flesh side to the God side, the God mind, the divine mind, the Christ consciousness, the Father and we don't do anything but we, what we see him do, say anything but what we hear him say. What have we done? We brought ourselves, we brought ourselves to the capacity of where we will do as Jesus said. When he said, these things shall you do and greater, because I go unto the Father. Now, here's a principle of life. Out of death comes forth life, subjectively. A woman who wants to have children, will yield herself to her husband, naturally speaking, to receive the seed into her womb. You plant a seed into the ground, the outer shell called the endosperm dies so that the life can come forth. 
So the principle of life is there's got to be a death before there can be a resurrection. There's got to be a crucifixion before a resurrection. For a woman, there's got to be a yielding of herself before there can be the fruit. Fruit of the womb, almost said fruit of the loom. Fruit of the womb, come forth. For a seed, if you want to have fruit, the outside has got to, has got to die. So what did we learn today? Allow the Jesus part, the flesh part, the God gave, the bios life part, the God gave, allow it to go to the cross of meditation. Strip away all of that which touches you from the outside and place upon yourself the scarlet robe of divine kingship. And how you do that is when you draw from the right side. And even if religion puts a crown of thorns on you, mocking what you believe, put the shut to the up. Say absolutely nothing, but move closer and closer to where deep calls into deep, to the inward part, which is what Jesus revealed to us. See, because listen, Jesus is not a fable. Jesus is a person within you and I, the left side, who goes to the cross with you and resurrects as the Christ of who you now are and know him no more just after the man of Galilee. Mm -hmm. Know him no more just as the son of man or just as the man who could do nothing. Listen, our left side can do nothing in and of itself, can do absolutely nothing. Now think about, had Adam done that? Had he taken his part that could do nothing? And yielded it to what God had said. I've made you in my image and my likeness and I've given you domin dominion. Had he done that, he would not have fallen thinking that he was naked. He would have kept the nakedness of being separate from worldly thoughts, religious thoughts, tempting thoughts. He could have stayed in that dimension and in that realm. But instead, his first mistake was that he began to allow the left-sided thinking to think, hmm, God said don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but I think I need to do something to become more like him. He said I'm in his image and after his likeness and I have dominion, but I don't see myself that way because he was judging himself by appearances. He didn't look like God, perhaps, exactly the way he thought he should look like God. And as a result, he partakes of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He drops down in his consciousness and all of a sudden, oh, I need some clothes. So they get the fig leaves and they sew the fig leaves together, which is nothing but allegorical religiosity. So he added more false thoughts to the false thoughts that he already had. And he, he spiraled downward into a place of thinking he was separate, thinking he was now a sinner, thinking he was this or that. When guess what? He never was. He always was. God said, who told you you're naked? I don't see you that way. See, and that's the problem in religion today. That's the problem in religion today, in religiosity today, is people think they are something that they are not. They don't understand that they need to retain and keep in their awareness who God told them that they were. One with him, never separate. One with him, upright, never a sinner, only in the thinking. So I trust this helped tonight, that it opened up some more clarity to the truths that we teach. And as I said, next week we're going to open up the crucifixion in Jerusalem, Sodom, and Egypt. And then we're going to talk about, go back to Revelation again, and we're going to talk in Revelation 11 about the two witnesses. And I'm not going to give it away, but it's going to be awesome. I'm already pumped and jacked up for it, and I have a whole week to wait. So, Father, we thank you for your truth. Our spirit that is conceiving and quickening these words within our heart awareness. That we can subjectively experience who we have always been objectively in you. That we can not do anything but what we see you do. Not say anything but what you 
what you say within us, or deep calls into deep. Thank you that we are your body, and we're growing up into the head in all things as we continually draw from your mind. We bless you, we honor you, and we love you because you first loved us. In the name of the Lord, amen. Amen and amen. amen.